Good evening, everybody. Um, just to first say thank you to Rob Becker. Rob is always here when we are live streaming so that the public can have some transparency and high quality audio and video. Um, so thank you, Rob. You're always really on point. Um, I feel like a television producer when you're around, so thank you. Um, so for those of you that are here, welcome. We're excited to talk today about our K-8 to state summative assessments. Um, I don't know if you recall, one year I started this conversation with a, a glee club from JMMS singing 525,600 minutes, which is a Broadway tune about how to measure a year. We measure our students in a lot of ways, so I just want to ground our conversations in that, that there's a lot of ways that we measure the success and health of our students in our district. Um, and so today we're going to be specifically talking about the uh, state summative assessments, which are made up of uh, the Next Generation Science Standards, Smarter Balanced, um, and I'll talk a little bit about those in local and regional context. But I just want to remind everybody, um, we measure our, our success in a number of ways, and so this is just one of those ways that you'll hear about today. Our focus is, I'll just give a brief overview of state summative testing in grades um, three through eight. I'll provide an initial overview of sort of the, the lay of the land of how we're going to proceed this evening. Um, we'll focus on the results in regional economic context, and we'll talk about language arts and math. I also want to talk a little bit about students who are consistently enrolled, and then our building principals will have an opportunity um, with their leadership teams to share some really exciting things that they've been doing. And all of these things sort of are grounded by, if you were here for the SAT presentation, you'll remember, so I'm gonna repeat myself, but for the public who wasn't, um, these four things that we really grounded ourselves in. This uh, June, we looked at um, and reflected, um, and then over the summer took some more time to reflect on the data to think about what, where are we and where do we wanna go and how do we get there? And so throughout today's presentations, um, you'll hear some of our teachers talk about building thinking classrooms. The academy had lots of conversations about increasing rigor and knowledge. So Christina's brief presentation will talk about that. Um, student goal setting and ownership is something that really stood out um, with Mamaguen and um, Ferrara's initiatives to try to get kids thinking about um, their performance and dat student teacher data chats and how students are experiencing their, um, SEL. And that along goes along with data analysis to monitor instruction. You'll hear about our JMMS team really grounding themselves in work on the win block, the what I need block, really strategically intervening. And again, I'm highlighting little things. All of our teams are really doing a lot of these things, but there's just a story to tell um, in the building level presentations as well. Um, and then all of this is re resulting in deep collaboration with our teachers and reflecting on, um, on what we need to do. And so Chris and his building are, is talking a little bit about those types of things along with data analysis to kind of continue to where are we, right? Uh, as I've said before, the data point, if you go to the doctor's office to get your blood pressure, that's not what makes you healthy. That measure helps us adjust habits and behaviors so that we can improve health. And so this is kind of where we are today, is looking at that data, understanding what it means and how it can help us inform our, our next steps. So this is a little bit repetitive for those of you that have been on the board for a while, but I wanna give everybody um, a quick chance to talk about our ELA um, and math smarter balanced assessment. Um, so again, this will be in the drive if you'd like to read this more closely. But the assessment is really just assessing that students can read and think critically, closely, and that they're reading complex texts at their grade level. Um, we want students to perfect, produce effective and really high quality writing. We want students to be able to use listening and speaking skills um, and adjust those to various audiences and research and investigate topics so that they can kind of analyze and, and put the information together. In math, there's concepts and procedures, knowing the concepts and then applying them, problem solving, um, reasoning and communicating what they think and how they're proceeding with the problem, and then using modeling and data analysis. And so you'll see 
that students, and again, um, students will be receiving their reports home in the mail. I think they've, most of you have received the packages in your buildings and we're getting them in the mail um, so that after this presentation, hopefully families are listening at home and learning all about it. But this is what students uh, and families might see on their report, whether your child um, met the standard or were at or near on each individual claim. So students and families will get that at home at their level at the student level. Um, so they get a couple of pieces of information. They will receive a performance category. Um, so we're looking at, when I'm giving you percentages today, I'm giving you the percentage of students who met or exceeded the benchmark. Um, if I'm talking about growth, the school's measures are gonna talk about some different things, um, but I'm looking at the average percent of target achieved at the school level. What percent of students in our school, you know, individual students would receive a target? If you perform this way, we would expect you to perform this way if you're making adequate progress, and so that's the average percent of target achieved. Um, that gives this performance category gives us a general sense of where the students have strengths and weaknesses, and this would be an example. So this student would be above standard with a check in reading, and the equal sign is like you're almost there, you're at or near. So this is an example of what a student's report would look like at home. Um, they get an average of what their student score was, what was the school average, and what was the district average. So families will receive this in their reports at home. And so the difference between growth and achievement, that proficiency is that one-time snapshot of a measurement of that student's performance. That growth is an achievement score for the same student between two or more points in time. So when you see growth points by school, we are excluding third grade pop quiz Y. Checking for understanding, right? It, there's no point of comparison. It would be the first time that they're taking the assessment. Um, just so, I'll keep you on your toes today. Um, so this is an example of the performance levels by scale score in this assessment. So you can see um, if you're in um, fifth grade and you're meeting um, proficiency standards, you would be scoring in within this scale score range. So you also know something that I like to do is see how we're doing among our peers, so to speak. So I look at what I call an alliance regional cohort. Um, alliance districts are digi districts with a designation based on our um, demographic profile. We receive some additional funding. Um, out of nine alliance districts in the ACES region, we are ninth in the, um, we're the le we, we receive the least amount of alliance funding out of all of those nine. Um, but those communities include Middletown, Meriden, Hamden, Naugatuck, Derby, West Haven, and Sonia, and New Haven. Um, and among those in our demographic research group is um, Middletown, Hamden, and Naugatuck. Um, so when I talk about our Alliance Regional Cohort, that would be the gray on this next slide. So you can see in 2018, 2022, over time, we've typically performed lower than the state average. That's your blue line, blue bar. Um, yellow shows that we've consistently performed above the average of the Alliance Regional Cohort um, and continue to do so, although in both the state East Haven and the Alliance Regional Cohort, there was a pattern of a um, dip in performance after the pandemic. So you see 1819, something missing, anybody notice? Anybody know why that's missing? Keep you on your toes. We did have testing, but because of the disruption of some students were remotely, it wasn't, um, they don't put those results in the same. We can't really compare apples to apples because some kids took them at home, some kids took them here, some kids were COVID quarantining. So we don't, do not include that. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't just a choice, it was the state does not agree that those are commensurate to be comparable. Um, and so they, they prepare those separately. Um, this is the 
um, smarter balanced hold on one second, school by school comparison. Um, these are students proficient and above in both ELA and math. Um, so you can see the blue bar is ELA, the lighter blue, and the darker navy is the math performance. Um, so on average, the district tends to perform at higher levels in ELA, um, which makes sense given the efforts that we've put into improving our reading and uh, science of literacy aligned curriculum. Um, although you can see that a couple of schools are performing at higher levels in, um, in ELA. E East Haven Academy and Mogwin um, are approaching 50% or 50% respectively in, e in ELA, um, which is exceeding pre-pandemic levels, which is, which is exciting to see. So there's been some, and Adam will talk to you a little bit about, and Christina might have an audio that I'll talk a little bit about what they did to get to those results. Um, similarly, uh, Ferrara and Mamagwen have seen some good results, improved results with their um, populations with regard to math, although math continues to be, and as we saw in the SAT presentation, an area of focus for improvement. This is the growth data. So this is the percentage of students who met their growth target. Can you see, Mr. Hennessy? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can see Tuttle in this particular scenario, a little bit of a rock star situation here. Um, we have 78% of students met their growth target in ELA and 80% in math. Um, so while typically Tuttle's population is a little, I would agree, would you agree it's a little more transient in some cases? Um, those students are meeting um, their target at higher, at high levels, as, well, as are Ferrara, especially in math, but also in, in reading. And I would say these are, you know, ac across the board, um, we're seeing improvement in, in all of these areas. So I just want to say this is because of our teachers. And so longevity is something that we've been trying to recruit and retain talent. If we look at the top performing classrooms, classrooms where students achieved at high levels up to, I think the range is in the top performing classrooms, like 50 to 88% of students met benchmark. Um, a hundred percent of those teachers have been in districts since 2018, 19 school year. And in math, we have 80% of those students. And I would argue that they're what we have a couple of rock star new teachers, um, that also have rock star veteran teacher grade level partners. So it's important to note that investing in our teachers, um, is something that we will continue to do. And I just want to thank them because those types of things that we're seeing is, is really helpful. Um, so we did, I wanted to include some, some information on variables because you'll see some of the grade level specific data has a little bit of information on, if you're looking from 2018 to 2022, 23, I'm going to show you a, um, the percentage of teachers that are, were in that classroom that remained in that grade level and classroom or that area by then. And so, um, I'm going to. We did, we have had some, some change, but I did look at the data. Um, less than, in grades three through five, it was harder for me. I did not do this data for the middle school. There's another slide with some data on the middle school. Um, but because of the nature of the smarter, uh, self-contained classrooms in three through five, um, less than 0.03% left the district. Um, in fact, of the, Teachers teaching grades three through five in 18, 25% of those teachers moved on to what I would call a new position in a teacher leadership role in the district, including um, we have some principals, we have some coaches. I think there's a couple of people over here that, that were in the classroom that might now be um, literacy or, or math coaches um, and supporting tier one instruction. We did have 12% of our workforce since 2018 in that three through five. There's more than that, so don't look at HR and be like, we've had more people resign. I'm only talking about teachers who administered Smarter Balance in 2018, 19, that were in a three through five classroom. And then of that, 12.5% moved to grade level. So they're still in the district, but because of enrollment numbers, they might have moved across town or across the hall. Um, and then staff turnover by school, um, 
there's 14% of the teachers that were teaching in those classrooms at Mamaguen um, that are still there today. Um, Tuttle, we have, it looks like 10% of those three through five teachers. And again, they might have moved in different places. Um, Ferrara is at 11%. East Haven Academy is at uh, 33%. Um, believe it or not, in six, this is in 6-8, 0% of our academy teachers um, in 6-8 are still there now. And 44% of our math, this is math and ELA teachers only at the middle school. Um, are still in the same role. So I'm gonna, I show you that because I have some information on the achievement that they'll be, that I'll call out. Um, so again, I'll talk a little bit about the ELA assessment. I'll, I'll review, this is an example of a sample passage the students would read and they have a little bit of uh, multiple choice. When we talk about learning to read at the K2 level, shout out to our K2 principal, thank you Laura for joining us. We start by teaching them to learn to read, letter sounds, decoding, and fluency. We measure those concepts with the Dibbles 8 and curriculum-based measures. But we then move along to understand how they're finding central ideas, key details, text structure features and word meanings, and then analyzing across text. This smarter balance is a measure of that that we use. The interim assessments, the iReady diagnostic, curriculum-based measures, and performance-based writing assessments that we get. Um, so just so you know about how this fits into our overall program. But as you can see, in grade three, this is 2018-19, um, and then we see a decline, 35.5% of students um, are uh, per achieving at that level in ELA and 27.6. So we do see a dip in the pandemic. What is exciting, um, 36.7% of grade four teachers were, um, of grade four students were achieving at benchmark, but we do see a um, return actually exceeding post-pandemic levels in grade four. Um, we see more, less of a gap between 18, 19 and 22, 23. We did see higher levels of achievement last year. Um, I don't know, um, you know, I, I'm exploring some variables as to, as to why that is, and our teams will talk a little bit about that. Um, last year, in terms of social emotional learning, for example, was an area of focus. Um, but those are the results comparing ELA and Smarter Balance. Um, and so in grade six through eight, again, we see a dip in pre pandemic to post pandemic levels. Um, this is not a match cohort, so this is different kids taking the assessment each year. Um, but you can see that we get closer to pre-pandemic levels in grade seven. In grade eight last year, we exceeded pre-pandemic levels, and we, um, in 22, 23, we um, saw a slight decline. But we do have 20% of our grade eight teachers are still in that role. Um, that were in that role in 2018, 19. So that's this little call out here. And math, again, explaining problems, completing their, their math problems quickly and accurately. There's a bit of fluency that is in that to, to discuss. Um, this is a sample of a grade three mathematics item. They would put the number that belongs in the box. They have to know how to navigate computer systems, which is something that is helpful because they have exposure to it in our other assessments, including our Envision Math platform. And again, these are that learning numeracy, identifying numbers, looking at patterns. We have curriculum-based measures, fact fluency, accuracy, um, and then we move on to use those numeracy skills to ensure overall academic success, things like using the math practices, understanding the operations, how numbers work together, algebra, how, the, how, to, how to find and solve for a missing variable, um, and problem solving and application. So a lot of different things go into helping our students demonstrate this. And uh, this is our comparison of achievement in our Alliance Regional Cohort in mathematics. So again, as you can see, the lighter blue, um, we were approaching 50% of students achieving at benchmark. Um, we consistently underperform when compared to the state of Connecticut, but since 2020, 21-22, we have outperformed our Alliance District cohort. This is a grades three through five, five math comparison. 
Um, so again, um, our grade three teachers, there's 22% of our grade three teachers are continuing in that role um, in 22-23. And we have, um, again, a similar pattern of exceeding pre-pandemic levels last year um, with some declines. And I was looking at the variability of the positions um, in terms of retirements and, and, and staffing. Um, this is the six through eight math comparison. Um, so again, we were exceeding 50% of students achieving pre-pandemic we're starting to inch up to get closer to that, um, but we're not quite there. And then finally, the next generation science assessment. So this is performance by school. Um, the district uh, across all students in grades five and eight, now Mrs. Pompano was able to share information regarding the next generation science assessment in the high school where they saw an 11% increase. Um, we did see um, Ferrara and Tuttle performing at the highest levels um, with generally around 30% uh, mark for the other schools. So we implemented the FOSS program at K2 um, so that there's more scaffolding and building up. That was, I think last year was our first year of that, or was that? So hopefully we'll begin to see those results as the students have brought the spiraling nature of using the hands-on, minds-on science materials for five years as opposed to just one or two. Um, we also think that there were some challenges during the pandemic with hands-on science when um, we were cohorting and, and, and trying to, to maintain social distancing. So I do think we see an impact there. Um, we do typically, and this is a trend that we see in the state, students perform higher in grades five than they do in grades eight and 11. Um, and so we do see we're 41.5% of our students on average um, in the district are performing by grade level um, at benchmark on NGSS science. And so the final couple slides I have are about continuous attendance. So I did some digging and I wanted to know um, we, I looked at a cohort of students in grades four through seven. Um, there's a tool that the state provides called the early indication tool, which allows me to see the district entry date and the um, total school moves. So these are kids who have had zero school moves and had a district entry date that was commensurate with what would, like if you were a third grader, it would have been 2019, if you were a, seventh grader, it would have been like 2015, 16 school year. Um, so among those students, First kindergarten. That's, that's, that's what I've sorted by to, to see could they be a, have been a starting kindergarten. And that the entry date was 2019. So it could have been like March or eight, as long as it was before December 31st of 2019 for a third grader, so on and so forth. Um, so it might not have been the first day, but within that school year before December 31st. Um, 75, so we have 41% of our students are in that category in grades four through seven. Um, I did not have that entry date available for grade eight because uh, in the early indication, in, in the early indication tool, but I'm gonna try to see if I can get it. 75% um, of those students are in good attendance standing. But what was interesting is I want to say, well, those students might not be high needs because they've been here consistently. That's not necessarily the case. 12.4% of those students were multilingual learners that we've had since kindergarten, and 48% of the, so almost 50% are still high needs students, um, with 17.5% of those students in a special education population. Um, so of those students, 86% met benchmark on the Smarter Balance last year, and 90, um, that's math, and 90 in ELA. Jen, can we just stay with my slide for one Sure. Four through seven. Four through seven. We're with us from kindergarten with no school moves, meaning they stayed with us from kindergarten all the way through seventh grade, 41%. 75% of those students had good attendance, which means they were not chronically absent. Right. 
of those students in grades four through seven with good attendance, 86% met the benchmark on Smarter Balance math, and 90% made benchmark on Smarter Balance. And that, again, there's a hidden message there. Would you share that hidden well, message, please? Again, the message is is that I'm going to be a data nerd for a second. I, if then, what I'm looking for is the variable, the curriculum, right? Are we teaching what the kids need to know and be able to do to meet the criteria? And over since since um, I started here, our teachers have worked tirelessly and not if you know what I mean to really develop those assessments and skills and platforms um, and and so I was wondering this was my test does that variable of curriculum matter um, and I think that we can see that if you're here with us and you can move through the spiraling nature of a program that's really a tier one program that's consistent and I think we also see that so the message is come to school Start with us, stay with us, and we're going to continue experience the coherence of the curriculum. Yes. And second message, our teachers are really hard workers and awesome. And our veteran teachers and new coaches have really taken on leadership roles to improve tier one instruction. I, I dug that in there too, sorry. Okay. So at this point, I won't take any questions, but please save them for the end because I want to make sure our principal and admin team have an opportunity to share. Um, we have Bob Swan who's going to start us off um, with a couple of slides about our exceptional populations. Are you, yeah, you going to do the Bob Road Show? Yeah, you can pop the, the slide up. And, you know, Jen and I work together on this. You can go right to the. This one? Yeah. Um, so, I mean. Rob, can you hear me? Check. So the slides on the performance aren't great. You can go through those. Who's, is, Rob, are you pressing those or am I pressing those? Yeah. I think what was really, so this is a really, so Jen and I sat together and brainstormed this slide today. It's the world's worst PowerPoint slide, right? Because it has about 5,000 words on it. So <laughs> it's, but when you get two people in the room who talk a lot and think a lot, this is what the slide produces. So let me, let me summarize it in a nutshell. Yeah, it's, it's got bullets. So <laughs> it's got a lot of bullets. So I guess that to summarize in a nutshell, one of the things we're really working with is not only what kids, and I want to just dovetail on something that Jen just said that I thought was great, what kids need to know and what, and what kids need to, to know and do, right? So one of the things we're working on, and kids ask this, is the why. Why do I need to know that? Right? Why do I need to know? Why is that important? Right? Then the other thing that we're really working hard on is not only the why, but how do we assess that? Is there a good way to assess that with all learners? Is there a way we can look at it differently? And is there a way we can teach it differently? Because one of the most important things we need to work on is, and recall is that special education students are regular education students first. As much as I love the phrase, Bob's kids, because I love them, there are kids. They're regular education kids. There are kids. They're not Bob's kids. They're not the special education students. There are kids. So we're working hard on that um, to ensure that those kids are held to the same high expectations, rigorous content standards, and expert content area instruction that all kids get because that's what's gonna raise their level when we teach to the edges, right? We need to teach to the edges, right? We, we, there's a tendency and it's easy to teach to the middle, right? We all wanna teach to the middle. We wanna coach to the middle, we wanna teach to the middle, but when we teach to the kids that are struggling and we teach to the, uh oh, Rob, they gotta lose the mic. When we teach to the high level kids, we raise those kids in the middle as well. So when we teach to the edges, that works for us. So that's something we're gonna work, we need to, expend some energy on. Um, the other note I wrote to myself, again, to summarize this slide, is that we need to ensure that there's a through line between the child's present levels of performance, the curriculum, and the goals and objectives. And that also is really, really hard work um, because you have to do it one kid at a time. And that's the summary of the, all those bullet points. 
Thanks. Jen. And I think when we nailed this down, this is more extensively what we are doing to operationalize this work. Professional development for all of our special educators to understand the standards so that they can identify present levels of performance and get them one step closer to mastering um, a prerequisite skill for grade level content. And so a couple of our principals are gonna talk a little bit about that. I believe we have Ferrara next. Are you ready? Thank you, is that good? All right, so um, when we look at uh, the data, there are several things that we use the data for. We use it to see what's working, what's not working, what we need to replicate, and what next steps might be. And we also look for correlations of things, okay? Is something an indicator that something else may happen? When we were looking at the SBAC data, we had one of the avenues that we went down, I'm gonna share with you now, is seeing if there was a correlation between our SEL data and how students are performing uh, the indicators of their SEL performance and if it lines up at all with how they are doing with their SBAC scores. And when I first started this journey with my coaches and Julie Church, thank you, um, kind of like common sense, it almost seemed like intuitive that, you know what, I bet, you know, the higher the uh, students score during their SEL, the higher they are on the levels of their indicators of being well grounded within themselves, I imagine those students would probably score pretty fairly well on the SBAC. The panorama uh, survey where we got this measures the students on these six uh, categories here, classroom climate, self-efficacy, growth mindset, grit, self-management, and social awareness. All right, so, Jen, what do I hit just next? Return? Yeah, got it. All right, so looking at the SEL and uh, SBAC correlations, and we just did this as a whole school snapshot, and you know, bear in mind that with both the data sets, both with SEL data and with the SBAC data, we can drill right down to the classroom level, which we have started to do, but just for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna give you a very general overview of what we found in terms of students that have um, a high emotional regulation according to the panorama and how they did on the SBAC. So summatively looking at our ELA, we had 61 students who scored levels three or four on the SBAC, right? And 79% showed SEL as a high strength or strength. So 80% of these students are the ones that scored within that um, realm on the ELA. For the summative math, we had 66 students who scored level three or four, and 83% showed SEL as a high strength or strength. And again, like I was saying, this is kind of almost what I expected to see. For our summative on the science, we had 25 uh, fifth grade students who scored levels three or four, and a little bit of a dip there, 52% um, showed SEL as a high strength or strength. And this generated some great conversations with the coaches, with Julie, but it also led us down another road that I wasn't anticipating going down, and which is actually the next slide. At Ferrara, with our panorama data, we had 29 students last year, 29 students, that showed an indication of them being emotionally at risk. 29. Listen to this. Out of those 29 students, 23 of those students scored at either a level one or two on the SBAC. 29 out of 23, or 23 out of 29, scored at levels one or two of those students that were at risk. All right, this is a correlation we've been talking more about. So what we did, we, then we dug deeper. We said, okay, out of those 29 students, what were the factors that most heavily influenced, what were the factors most heavily weighed on them that gave them this score? 
Now, as, as an educator, someone who's been experienced, I gotta tell you something, I was dead wrong on this. Because my need, remember this, uh, Mayor? I said, my, my knee-jerk reaction, I said, I bet we're gonna find their mindset. So we do a lot of talk about mindset, okay, as educators. I bet their mindset is going to be the number one indicator. As it turns out, it was the last, it was the last indicator, only 10 students out of the 29 students had that as a deficit criteria. The very number one, which was classroom climate, 26 out of the 29 students had that as a criteria that showed up as a deficit for their overall SEL indicator. So what's that mean? What's that mean for me? What's it mean for my staff? I'm gonna tell you something, in SEL, and sometimes it's like trying to hold on to water, right? And you, you, know, and, and you wanna do something, you know you gotta do something, Having this information, knowing this, classroom climate, because I don't know if you saw on the previous side, classroom climate was made up of two indicators. One was relationships, okay? But the other one was also the physical environment, okay? How easy is it to have the student come in, I mean, relatively easy, to have, and, and have the classroom set up and have it be inviting, have it be warm, all right? Because it's show, it, it has a direct impact on the psyche, on the well-being of the students. And I believe that there is enough of a correlation, and I know this is a small sample size, and it's by no means like a scientific study or anything like that. But man, there, you know, it is the beginning of a correlation that I see for our school, and it's a conversation that I'm gonna have with my, that I've already had with my teachers, and that I'm gonna be continuing to look at as the years go by and we keep doing this panorama, right, Jewel? Yes? All right, um, so that was one of the conversations and roads that we went down with this. So thank you for that. Who's next? Am I introducing the next speaker? Sure. All right, and it's my great honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Mr. Brown. There you go. Thank you very much. It is always sometimes very difficult to go after Paul does his presentations. Um, so I want to tell you we did the same type of action in, in looking at the data we had available for Tuttle School. Um, I prepared two slides for you. The first slide has three points that I'd like to walk us through, a little bit of a lens relocated for each one, and a second slide which just has one single point that I'd like to make. Uh, we followed some of the exact same type of things moving through the steps. And I was paying attention to which button to push. So the top one here is a, is a broad stroke look at how Tuttle performed this past year. It showcases on the left our performances for English language arts and mathematics, which Dr. Murray began highlighting as we started our presentation. And I kind of look at that under our own roof, where are we? How are we doing overall with the students who come in and take their test with us? I'd like to move to a little breakdown though and find out how we are in parity with the other schools in our district. So the, the numbers, and again, to Bob's point, maybe too much text, but grades three, four, and five in literacy and math, what I did was try to find out where we fell um, in comparison to all of our sister schools. So in three particular areas, Tuttle performed below the district average. In one area, we performed on the district average. And in two areas, we performed above the district average. Kind of a different snapshot looking at where we are in parity with the others. We're sort of right in the middle of everything that's going on. So I wanted to get a little closer and, and start to work on an action plan that looks at, well, where did we get those results? So digging a little deeper in the data, um, we noticed that at some grade levels, a particular teacher highlighted a particular level of performance. For example, if one teacher had a very high language arts score and perhaps the, the math score wasn't as strong and the opposing grade level teacher had the, the opposite situation happen, was performing high with, with math mathematics and a little bit lower performance in the literacy area. So one step of our school improvement plan for this year is to look at those skills that are held by some of our teachers and find our ways to bridge the gap to either grade level partners. So a lot of Tuttle's plan this year is to do some in-house professional development, finding out what are some of those skills and some of those lessons that are being designed by an individual that are kind of getting us those results and how can those best be shared, either warehouse format, presentation, or, or, or make and take. The third lens I wanted to look at on this slide was how are we doing with our own students over time? So I pulled out a longitudinal cohort. This looks at the performance of students in 2021, 2022, and 2023 on our ELA summative scores. And the, the column that I chose to leave here was our students who were performing in the well below area. 
So the first year, 55% of our students, and again, this is a cohort. This is the same group of students that moved from year to year. 55% of our students were performing in a well below category. A year later, a year later, 48% of those students were still performing well below. And finally, on the third year, 31% of those students were still performing well below. Obviously, we're making progress. Do we want to continue to improve? Yes. And we're showing how we're trying to close the gap for some of those neediest learners. Again, Bob, lots of text. Um, this was the, the second slide of my two, and I really wanted to make a, a very significant point. When we look at our data, we try to let the results speak for themselves. We try to look and extrapolate and see what it is that's going on. And I'm, I'm really glad Paul pointed out sometimes we have misconceptions. But I wanted to, to take a different route than the SEL and look at our attendance. Um, so here's, here's a highlight of our history of attendance at Tuttle School. In 1819, our chronically absent students, which is defined as missing 10% or more in an instructional year, either based upon an entry date or if you're with us for the entire year, that's 18 plus days, 14% of our students in 3, 4, 5 were chronically absent. A year later, we set our goals to reduce that number. Unfortunately, we were interrupted with uh, interrupted learning. Uh, we began the first half of the year, we had 19 students chronically absent, and by the end of the year, it was six. So we averaged at about 12.5 for that year. Um, end of year 2021 was 14.5. End of 2022 was 13%. And then we had a really significant uptick last year. Uh, our chronic absent number of students by year end was 22% for our last calendar year. Very significant. We did have a, a lot of um, absenteeism due to some illnesses and, and um, respiratory virus, obviously resurgence of some of our COVID cases. But we really are targeting that attendance is that important for your students to be in the classrooms receiving the well-designed instruction that we're trying to provide to support them in their performance. And, and this is a, a really ties in nicely to Paul having gone just before me and Jen's original presentation. Well, what's going on? So we looked at those students who were chronically absent, and we drew a line from there to their performance on SBAC. So for our particular grades, out of our grade three students, the students who were chronically absent, 100% of those students who were deemed chronically absent scored in a level one or two on SBAC. Of our grade four students, 75% of those students who are chronically absent scored on a level one or two on SBAC. And finally, in grade five, 75% of those students that were chronically absent scored a level one or two. So what we're doing is we're spending our time designing really good high quality instruction. We need the students to be more available to access that. So we had, uh, in summation, 22 of our students who are chronically absent, or 82% of those students who were deemed chronically absent fell into those lower range of performance. We need um, a big, strong academic push this year, I'm sorry, attendance push this year at Tuttle School to make sure that all our learners are coming in the door ready, willing, and able. Um, and just, just to highlight one strategy, um, one thing that's challenging is student arrival. Uh, when students arrive at our school, um, they have to shift into student mode. One of the most helpful ways to do that is having a student travel with their peers by bus which means they're kind of slowly adjusting from home mode to school learner mode. Uh, so we ended last year with 140 students being transported to school. We started this year with um, 95 students being drop dropped off and picked up, and we are right now at 47 students. So we're trying to make a significant change that, that highlights that entrance into the building, ready and prepared for learning, um, and I, I think it's gonna have some success. And again, I look forward to working with my team this year on, on trying to support those initiatives. I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague and friend, Adam Swinney from Omogwin School. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for this opportunity to come together and to reflect on our learning growth from this last year. Uh, my name is Adam Swinney. I'm the proud principal of Omogwin School. When we were taking a look at our Smarter Balance Assessment data, we really wanted to focus specifically on that um, target growth data that Jen was talking about earlier. Um, this is an area where, when you looked at Mamagwan's performance against other schools in the district, where our percentages were not as high. And we wanted to really try to understand what was going on with our own achievement data in this regard. So you can see that that's mapped out here next to the performance distribution um, in the 
blue indicators. Specifically, we had our highest average growth target being met across fourth grade, but when we drilled in to looking at the individual classroom and student data, we found a wide variance when we looked at our teachers in terms of years of experience in education, not only being new to Mamaguin, but new to the career in general. Um, in one case, we um, can see as much as a 36% discrepancy between overall student performance of students being at or above proficient. And this is really notable for us because last year when we started the year, um, we have 16 uh, classrooms in Mamaguin, and six out of those 16 classes um, were with an early career teacher new to our building. Um, we have worked really strategically, and um, I attribute great support as well with Superintendent Forty, thinking about some strategic staffing as we moved into this year, to thinking about how we are not only nurturing the growth of our students, but we're making sure that our early career teachers feel heard, valued, and supported in their trajectory as well. Um, we only needed to hire two new teachers as we moved into this year, and we've really balanced our mentoring support so that everyone has the space to learn and grow and ultimately benefit our students. But similar to Tuttle, we wanted to take a look um, closer at a steady and startling trend with our attendance data. Across the last three years, we have been on a steady increase with our chronic absenteeism rate. So students who are missing at least 10%, if not more, of the school year. Uh, last year, uh, we had just over 21% of our student body uh, were chronically absent. When we take a look not only at chronic absenteeism, but also that high danger rate, so maybe not 18 missed days, but in the high teens, we had uh, around 30% at both third, or all of uh, third, fourth, and fifth grade were in a uh, concern area with their attendance. Layering that back with the percent of students meeting their target growth, we found some interesting indicators. So specifically, um, the greatest variance was in English language arts. When we compared students who had uh, attendance concerns, so either chronically absent or in the high danger range, versus their peers with good attendance, we found a discrepancy of 12% at fifth grade um, as, and 10% at fourth grade, so a difference in how students were performing. There was not a major significance, however, in math, which we found kind of curious. So we wanted to probe that a little bit further and think about, well, who are these specific students that um, were not attending? And so when we layered on not only attendance concerns, but looked at students um, who have an individualized education plan or a 504 504 plan or are receiving tiered intervention support, that's where we found the most significant variance in fourth and fifth grade. And the discrepancy again in ELA is quite startling. By, in fourth grade, it was a difference of 43% in terms of proficiency rates um, and meeting that target growth um, that supports students to meeting that proficiency over time. Now, as we talked about, third grade do not have a target growth data. However, we looked at their overall performance distribution. And again, when those same indicators were in place, um, no student scored uh, above a two in this area. So that's a real area that we are focusing on as we move into this year. We know that last year, as indicated, there were a lot of factors that impacted families' decisions with getting to, um, students to school each day. And I want to shout out our Mamaguin um, community. Our families are fantastic. They work with us around this, and they, um, they want their students in school. But when faced with COVID, RSV, a really difficult flu season, the numbers still accrued. And that is still time that's lost. So as we move forward, we're looking specifically at these trends and specifically looking at some of the subgroups and how they uh, came in with their chronic absentee rates. Again, a f zeroed in focus on our exceptional learners or students with an identified disability. Their chronic absentee rate was as high as almost 29%, um, which was really significant when compared with the rest of the population. So this year we are taking a really specific focus on not only our uh, academic achievement, but also chronic absenteeism and improving attendance for all of our learners. We've started very early with proactive measures that are supportive um, for families and hopefully welcoming for all students. But we're also looking back to last year to see where we find success stories at the individual classroom level 
level or individual partnerships between students, families, and school where um, the attendance did not have a significant impact on their overall achievement. What were we doing differently in those cases that we can replicate and learn from? So that's a big part of our um, school improvement plan moving forward into this year. Thank you. And we are going to turn things over to our team at JMMS. Good evening. Um, to start with tonight, I'd like to acknowledge Nate Testro, um, our new assistant principal, and our instructional leadership team. Uh, we work together as a leadership team at JMMS uh, to help all of our students move forward. I appreciate everything that our elementary school principals have said of the data that they've brought forward has an impact when the students come to us in sixth grade um, as they start to work on improving uh, Student achievement in elementary school, it makes our job easier in middle school. But the truth of the matter is, is that when students come to us, we see more varied gaps than what they have in elementary school. Um, and so when we receive students in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they can have gaps that go down as far as first grade, um, beyond grade level, or be above grade level. Uh, our scores are up here. Uh, Dr. Murray, he presented them earlier. Our our, the lens that we're looking through right now is what do we do to improve? We know where we are. What do we have to do to move forward? We've made significant changes at JMMS over the past two years. Uh, last year we implemented a new schedule, uh, working collaboratively with the teachers union to put the wind block in place. Uh, we rolled out a wind block last year and then we spent a lot of time over the summer to tweak that wind block and to make sure that it is uh, more effective this year than it was last year. So a few things that we're working on, um, staff is working collaboratively to review and revise the wind block. This year, every teacher received the materials that they'll be using during that wind block. All of our students have been looked at using both SBAC and iReady scores. We know we had some significant growth in iReady last year uh, across the building. Um, however, we had growth, but not necessarily proficiency. We need our students to make that growth in order to, to meet proficiency, not only on iReady, but on SBAC as well. Uh, and the, the means that we're using to, to meet that achievement that we're looking for is to look at what students students' individual needs are. So when we have an, a class of eighth graders, the needs in that room can vary greatly because there's years of lost learning that might have happened due to chronic absenteeism, illness, whatever the case might be. So we're using multiple data points to be able to look at individualized student needs. Students get split up across the grade level and they get put into a small group to address their individualized needs with a certified teacher. Um, along with that, however, we do want to make sure that we're recognizing, like Dr. Murray, he said, that SBAC is only one data point. And one of the big things that we've been working on at JMMS is creating an assessment framework that shows us truly what students are learning in the classroom. Making sure that our assessments are linked with um, all of our standards, that our depth of knowledge on our questions are matching that of what's expected on SBAC. Uh, we want to make sure that we're assessing our students throughout the school year looking for the same outcome that we're looking for on SBAC at the end of the year so that we can adjust our instruction as necessary um, as we move along. So we're working hard to not only create valid and reliable assessments, but then to teach teachers how to use those assessments to drive their instruction. Um, we've done a lot of professional development work on it already this year, uh, and we will continue to work with teachers to make sure that they know how they can use that assessment data to break down small groups for reteaching, reassessing, and making sure that we're truly finding out what students are mastering. Along with that, uh, we've really worked hard on implementing and continue to work hard on implementing the JMMS Habits of Success rubric that ties directly with our vision of the graduate. And the reasoning behind this is that we know that students who come to school prepared, ready to learn, who persevere, are students who end up being successful academically. Uh, we have students who come in and they can work their tails off and maybe they just get a C and that's okay because they're working their tails off. And we know that we'd rather see that than the student who comes in and doesn't, doesn't become the student who is the hard worker and perseveres um, and, and is resilient. And that when they graduate, maybe they're not gonna make the best worker, um, but they do okay in school. We wanna produce students students who are hard workers um, and are, who are meeting our vision of the graduate. So we're making sure that we're separating that criteria out from academic criteria. You don't see that in grades. We want to make sure that grades are a true reflection of what students are learning and mastering in line with the standard, uh, with the state assessment that they'll be taking at the end of the year. A lot's happening academically. We also know, especially at the middle school level, um, that that social emotional learning piece plays a huge role as well. And I know that some of our elementary school principals talked about that. 
We know that at the middle school level, we tend to see more suspensions than we do in elementary schools. We're working really hard to keep kids in class. If they're not there because they're suspended, they're not learning. Uh, we're bringing in quite a few new programs this year. One is a partnership with the, LD, in the, with the ADL, pardon me, to become a no place for hate school. Um, working a lot, we worked a lot last year on anti-bullying. Um, the ADL, works with us um, in collaboration. Mr. Testro is leading that up for us. It improves school climate, which in turn reduces bullying, um, creates that school that students want to come to when we talk about chronic absenteeism. We know that, uh, that we want kids to be in school and creating an environment that they want to be in is helpful. We have um, an issue with vaping in the building. And when kids vape and get suspended, they're no longer available for learning. We're partnering with Yale this year um, for a vaping cessation program. They'll come in and work with sixth graders in the hopes of leading to decreased vaping in the building. Uh, we are also working with the East Haven Wellness Alliance on a grant, uh, again, an anti-vaping grant. We are also putting in um, an alternative to suspension program that we had started a little bit last year, uh, but it, uh, and I'm gonna let, I'm gonna have to come up and talk about it in just a second, okay? But um, I'm gonna have Nate talk to you a little bit about what that ATS program looks like um, in the, specifically in the area of vaping. So these are some of the things that we're doing to improve the culture and climate and to improve student achievement. To back up just a little bit um, on those win groups as well, another piece that I wanted to mention is that when we look at our scores, it's not just our students who are struggling that we wanna help improve. We wanna make sure that we're looking at our students who are on and above grade level and that they're still making growth as well. So one of the things that we've done this year during our win block is we've implemented an enrichment program in each of the three grade levels. So our sixth graders who are receiving enrichment are receiving enrichment in the area of science. Our seventh graders are working on a National History Day project during their enrichment group. And our eighth graders are working on Future Cities, um, which is a competition that they will participate in where they have to research um, and learn about a project, how they can create a sustainable city, a future city um, using recyclable products. Uh, they will do a research project, write a paper, it involves math, reading, language arts, et cetera. So there's a lot that we're doing at the middle school. I am gonna ask Nate to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the vaping program that we're bringing in for our after school kids. All right, thanks for having me everybody. So to touch on more of the vaping program, um, as uh, me and Darcy talked throughout the summer and throughout the year, we understood that there was a need, right, to have some interventions in place for students who um, are considering vaping um, or have vaped in the past. Um, and as we obviously catch the kids throughout the year, we want to support them, right? So we're going to take a supportive lens. So there's a couple different programs that we are going to implement. Um, the first one is through the American Lung Association. Um, it's a program called In Depth. Um, essentially, the way it works is if a student um, asks for help, or if we catch a student vaping, um, that, that, that sort of triggers this program. The student comes after school and works through a curriculum, a traditional curriculum. They work with me or a certified staff member, and there's a series of lessons made to explicitly teach the student why it's not a good idea. So lesson one touches on the health aspects of it. Lesson two touches on the financial aspects of it. Lesson three touches on the social aspects of it. And lesson four asks students to reflect on um, things that are very specific to them and the, what some of the underlying ideas and reasons are why they might be turning to this that might not have been picked up in the original program. So students go through this program with the ultimate goal of steering them in the right direction, right? So that's the first program. They meet with us after school and in the meantime, those students are still in classes, right? Vaping is not something that is incredibly dangerous for other students where they need to not be in the classroom. And we know that part of solving chronic attendance, sorry, part of solving chronic attendance is giving students a maximum amount of seat time. We understand that we have professionals in the classroom that have given their lives and career to making good lessons, and we don't wanna pull kids out of those classes for something that, um, for a behavior that can be adjusted through education. So that's the first program. Um, if this becomes chronic, if a student um, still decides to take this action again, um, of course with parent permission, we will, implement, we will implement a little bit more of an intensive program. Uh, that program is a 10-day program um, called NOT. Uh, that program is also through the American Lung Association and it's a more intensive version that does focus on actually trying to get you to stop um, and find some 
basically sub support groups that will help you get through that process. Because if you are caught at school multiple times or if your parent comes to us and say, hey, and says, hey, we think this is a real issue, we wanna intervene, but it might need to be more intensive. So that system is a 10 different lesson system with ongoing monitoring um, through the next couple months with the goal of helping students stop. But again, we understand that students who are in the classroom, to go back to all of your presentations, students that are in the classroom really learn a lot here and it's super important to us to keep them there and feeling supportive, um, supported and to support families as well when they reach out to us and say, hey, I'm noticing some things, do you see anything here? So that's sort of how those programs work out. Um, we are applying for a grant um, if we get that grant, there's a third program that we would implement if necessary. Um, I'm not gonna speak about it yet because we haven't gotten the grant yet, but if, but if we do, there is a next step there. Um, so that's more about that. Um, other ATS systems or alternative to suspension systems that we focus on is, um, is this now a good time, yeah? Oh, great. So those other systems, um, they talk and they, we sort of create scenarios and situations with students who do things that would trigger a traditional suspension. And we work with them and create action plans to try to reduce the probability of that same action happening again. If a student does something that would traditionally cause a suspension that is not dangerous, there's learning that needs to happen. We can't just toss them out of class because they're not learning anything then. So they spend time with me or other certified staff after school doing accountability projects where they reflect on what happened make an action plan, learn skills, actually work on a variety of coping strategies with the goal of not having it happen again. I don't want repeat offenders. And that's what alternative to suspension is all about. And that's sort of the main goal of it. And I can just share with the few alternative to suspension programs that we used last year at the end of the year. Um, those students um, have not been repeat offenders and they were prior to that, so that's great. Um, with the whole point here being that we need to keep kids in class. We need to have them available for the win class. We need to have them available for their tier one instruction. If we're going to raise our state scores, we have to have kids in school learning. Uh, we've done a great job reducing our discipline referrals at the middle school. Our suspension rates were still pretty high last year. We're hoping to bring them down this year. Uh, again, in order to keep kids in class, using that targeted instruction and using valid and reliable uh, data from rewritten assessments to help us guide our instruction and to get kids to where we need them to be. Thank you very much. As you can see, a lot goes in when we collaborate and build um, systems with community partners. Um, going back to my original four um, themes. I do understand from Melissa that um, Christina has informed us she's not able to be here in person today but has an audio recording of the scenario. So I'm going to Good evening, East Haven Public Schools Board of Education members. This is Christina Torrey, principal of East Haven Academy. Due to illness, I am unable to be there in person this evening. However, I have included this audio to further explain our data. As you know, East Haven Academy is unique in that we have students at both the elementary level and the middle school level. Therefore, the data presented on this slide is the cohort of students who took our Smarter Balanced Assessment in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and will again take it this spring as sixth graders. The data before you shows our overall performance on the mathematical portions of Smarter Balanced. As you can see, the highest percentages of students who performed at or above grade level standard three years in a row came from responses from Smarter Balance assessment questions that fell under the concepts and procedures claim. Claims are defined as broad statements that will outline the outcomes achieved with mastery of the standards within it. Questions successfully answered within the concepts and procedures claim demonstrate that students can Apply, explain and apply mathematical concepts, 
and carry out mathematical procedures in precision and fluency. Questions asked within this claim primarily apply depth of knowledge questions at level one, which consists of recalling and reproducing information and depth of knowledge questions level two, which requires students to apply a skill or concept with two or more steps. The lower percentages of students performing at or above grade level fell under the communicating reasoning and problem solving, modeling, and data analysis claims, which both primarily apply depth of knowledge questions at levels two, levels three, which is strategic thinking in developing a plan with complexity and sequence, and also level four, which is extended thinking in investigating multiple conditions of a problem. Although this data we are viewing is just for the math portions of Smarter Balance, we also found very similar trends throughout the ELA results from this same cohort of students. Due to the trends we have found in our data, our school is heavily focusing on professional development on the regular and consistent implementation of depth of knowledge questioning at all levels. We are looking at our current instructional implementations and collecting both quantitative and qualitative data in regards to the questions we are asking students and the opportunities we are affording them throughout all classroom learning. This work is an area of focus on our school's updated theory of action and was recently among the foci at our last building data meeting and building-based professional development. Collaborative work to improve our consistency with depth of knowledge at levels one through level four will continue throughout all of our professional learning this year with the intention and hope that this work will then be reflected in higher percentages of students at or above grade level within all of the Smarter Balanced claims. Focus and continued work with depth of knowledge will lend to higher order thinking among all content areas. This graphic demonstrates how the implementation of depth of knowledge at all levels lends to more consistent and rigorous opportunities for our students, not only in math, but in reading, writing, and science. These focus areas also completely align with the East Haven Public Schools vision of the graduate as it will foster an increase in informed thinking, problem solving, and effective communication skills. Thank you. Thank you. So just to wrap it up, um, you heard four things. If you leave with four things, then you know the idea is that when we collaborate and share best practices, as Chris showed you with his grade levels, with higher levels of performing one in ELA and math, and getting them together to share those things, we saw that. When we think about data analysis, Adam's high level view of really what made a difference for kids and how to reduce gaps in, um, with students in all um, populations, and then thinking about student goal setting and meeting with kids to think about how to gain the skills that they need, um, we saw. So again, thinking classrooms, as Christina shared with us, and understanding students' social emotional needs, as Paul shared with us. So just to summarize, we need this time when we're collaborating, we're thinking about kids building their skills to own their learning and having ownership um, as a team, that they're not, as Bob said, our kids or your kids, they're all of our kids. Um, building thinking classrooms, collaboration, being data literate and using that data to act um, are, are some of the things that we've used this data to really implement high quality plans that are starting to yield results. So thank you to my team. Thank you to the wonderful folks who showed up in the audience to join us today and for the board um, for your attention during this time. I know it's a lot. Um, families, a little shout out. You should check your mailbox in the coming week or so. Um, your next generation science standards and smarter balance reports will be sent out early next week. 
um, and we value everyone's partnership, please reach out to me if you have any questions about the reports or your building principals um, and instructional leaders at the middle school um, as well. Uh, your coaching team and building leadership teams are also knowledgeable. Um, so if you have any concerns or questions about your child's performance specifically, reach out to your building or Smarter Balance and NGSS sort of in, in bird's eye view, um, we are always happy to help. And that concludes our portion with the addition of Q&A. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. I have a question and a comment. Yeah. First, I know over the years, the, our coaches, um, their role has changed a little bit. Okay. They were doing intervention. I wonder, what is the percentage that coaches are actually working with teachers? So the vision of, of, of the coaching role is to improve tier one instruction. That is the vision. And actually, I believe very strongly that what gets measured gets managed. And I act, if you have any coaches here, I ask them what percentage. Because if it's supposed, it's supposed to be 80 20, right? So there is a little, there's win groups, they're supposed to be intervening. If you're a certified teacher, if you're Wilson trained, there's an expectation that you might have a group or two, but there's 80 20. I continually monitor that, and at our at our monthly leader, literacy and numeracy leadership team meetings, I will ask and poll the team and collect that data to then work with principals to determine how we can get closer to that. I think that's really super important that you're yep. working with, with our teachers. You're absolutely right. And that's I a know great question. With, with you know attendance issues and a lack of subs, they sometimes get pulled into classrooms. Yep. And we need to do something so that. We have, I would say, continuously, and again, some of my coaches who are, who are at my meetings are hearing me kind of beat this drum, um, that we, we can intervene with 100 kids, but the power of the coaching model is to get all teachers better at delivering that small group, high quality, evidence-based instruction, and our coaches are there to do that. Um, and so we've seen... I would say in some of our, maybe our admins would talk about this, we've had deep conversations about how to improve the role of the coaches, how to build their capacity, how to help them get into classrooms where they may be a, a teacher who um, maybe is veteran and has something to offer um, the coach but doesn't really know about the model or, you know, there's a lot of ways. So we really work on that as a team, but it, it, you're absolutely right. Can we see that data? I would love to see sure. that data. I would agree. I, I do a survey on our district literacy and numeracy plan, including the embedded coaching um, success. So I'm happy to sit with to any. Right yep. Comment. Sure. Can I so add to one thing? Mention, Hold sorry. on. About the coaches. Yes. We recognize the power of coaches working in classrooms, impacting tier one instruction so much so that several years ago we used recovery funds to hire interventionists to do that portion of the work that coaches were also doing, that stretched them really thin, leaving a void in terms of the coaching for tier one instruction. And, and the work. board was super supportive in that. We used grant fundings, we brought those positions, they were new positions through to the board. Um, and slowly, as those grant funds are going away, we're trying to absorb those positions into the operational budget mm -hmm. so they can focus on just that. It's a great, great question, Marianne. It's important. So that leads to my comment, because I think you mentioned, um, or someone mentioned, the fact that there are definitely classrooms in our district, and I think we could probably go all the way up to the high school, where the instruction is impeccable. And I think we all can name a, a ton of teachers mm -hmm. that have unbelievable instructional practices. Mm -hmm. I think we need to dig deeper and see exactly what's going on in those classrooms. Why are they successful? And we need to use those strategies across the district, and not just building-wise. I mean, why we should be using those teachers and leadership really? opportunities yeah. to really help others. Treat our so theories of action. Another great you did. point. We did. I talked to the board about at the end of the year presentation about that model where we took highly effective educators that continually get high levels of student outcomes, replicable year after year after year, and bringing in new teachers who are just starting early career and creating a mentorship and a co-teaching model. I was able to secure grant funds to do it for one pilot classroom this year 
um, in fifth grade at Mamawin School in attempt to help do exactly what you're explaining. And I know it's about strategies, but I think if we take a deeper look, we're gonna find it's not just strategies, it's practices. Planning and preparation is a practice. The planning and preparation leads to high leverage strategies, strategies that are implemented by the classroom and teacher. Do they have time to meet at the common grade level? The, though the, that teacher and the new teacher and the experienced teacher who has high, high levels of academic outcomes are actually in the same classroom for the entire year. And Co generally teaching. all population, all teachers have common, um, um, I believe yeah, yeah. But the, my example that I'm talking yeah. about is a, a pilot example where we're building the capacity of a new educator alongside a veteran, highly effective educator that are doing the work together over the course of the year. And then, as an aside, should we have a maternity leave or someone who's out for a little bit, the new educator, early career educator, can step into a classroom on their own, still with the support of the master teacher, so that there's not a void for that period of time. We and there's not a rotation in subs, right? We need to fund more of that. We do. And, so and here, we're looking really closely at that. It's really, I get really excited about it because I think it was a huge variable you saw here this evening. And every data point you saw here this evening was connected to our four priority areas that the board has put in place. Academics, culture and climate, operations, and talent. And I, just to sort of make visible some of what you're talking about over the last several years, um, we've put in place more opportunities for teacher leadership, including the curriculum leader roles, where teachers had to submit to, to get to a lesson plan and evidence of efficacy. They're leading curriculum meetings where they're having guaranteed time monthly to co collaborate as a grade level partnership. Um, all of our administrators are took sort of a look at those high yield evidence-based strategies. Are you coaching and prompting use of academic vocabulary in your class, for example? We have a Google Doc, and this is where you can come on in. Any board member, if you'd like to grab an iPad and come on some learning walks uh, with us and just think about what we see, I, you'll see those sort of indicators were intentionally chosen based on those things that are, t and, and it, um, Many of our classes, teachers participate as well. Um, many, I think all of the buildings, the teachers would participate, although it is a tool um, that we're looking for patterns because we know, and in, in my meetings with the individual principals in developing their theories of action, we literally looked at the classroom level. This performance of this group of students in this class with this teacher and identified those two or three highest performing and what we can um, replicate and how we can build expertise in leadership including so that's with the curriculum leader positions as well as um, funding for professional development facilitation and ways for teachers to do that and get in front of their peers either at faculty meetings grade level meetings or um, professional learning days so yeah but are the coaches really being taken out of that are they back in now yeah. We have an interventionist and a coach at every building, and I, you can, if you look at the minutes, it'll say, you know, if, if there's a barrier in terms of coverage or somebody, you know, I, I ask them to reach out to me if there's, if, if, because the idea is that they're being utilized to support tier one instruction. And we really have, th you know, the, the thoughtful and intentional conversations about how to, how to do that effectively and efficiently um, and I think our coaches are really good about saying you know in the past with COVID quarantining and stuff um, but I've had intentional conversations with coaches who are releasing responsibility um, maybe for the long-term sub to help making sure they're in that coaching rotation even so. if they're just popping in to the teacher who's absence just to hold down the literacy block that's still impacting core instruction right, right? We say it all the time, the single most influential factor on student achievement is the teacher. Their practices, their strategies, and what Paul pointed out tonight, the classroom environment that they built. Well, and you have to so, look at the perception of, of the student, and that, that was clear in what Paul presented. Their right. perception was the climate. Like, how does it look? How does it feel? How do I feel in this room right, right now? 
Really? So it, it all ties into SEO as well. Are the coaches, the coaches don't evaluate, correct? No, absolutely not. Okay. I just want to make, make sure. Because some people have turned them almost into that mm -hmm. aspect, and they come on the walks, which is fine, but they need to be in there, like you said, to really work with them. But isn't it tier one and tier two? Shouldn't tier two be in a classroom situation? So correct. I can. Uh, we actually have slides about tiered instruction in East Haven. I could present if you want another workshop about the the sort of tiered definitions and what co the coaching role in the interview. We actually have a graphic, Erica, and I made a couple of years ago with the with like the percentages. So 80-20 for coaches, 100% of the interventionist time should be working in intervention when we created those positions. So we, we really try to create a shared definition of what that is and our coaches are even working at our last meeting on like um, helping redefine and carve out even some time at their faculty meeting to, to um, create a shared vision of the role. Um, because just like Paul, the SEL needs of the students, um, I don't know, we follow a cognitive coaching model, which is really inviting the thinking of the think of the of the participant, of the of the person. So it's not like I'm coming in here to tell you what you're doing wrong. It's let's thought partner together. Let me roll up my sleeves and talk to you and we'll examine the data together and we'll we'll, we'll and that is, you know, an evidence based coaching model that all the smart you people in the ivory tower say will work for kids. To reach out as well and say, yeah. Hey, I need help here. Please right. Please. They need to feel comfortable in that because nobody expects them to be perfect, you know, the first year. You know what I'm saying? We and have I have expectations, but they need to feel that comfort level. And our right? coaches have done a really great job inviting, um, being inviting, being um, open. Uh, you know, I, I'd love to get them in front of the group because they're some of the most impressive people. I they really, they them. really have. Um, Done a, done a great, yeah, yeah. And so if you're, you know, again, um, I tell them, and Erica, I think st strategically, everything that we do is coaching. Even if it's supporting a new um, teacher with, you know, implementing foundations, that still is a part of coaching because you're modeling a lesson and then debriefing that with the individual who's in the room and releasing that responsibility and helping address any barriers that uh, an individual might have to seek out coaching, making sure that our um, that professional development keeps that through line. So what you're doing in the classroom is job embedded. What you did on the PD day, the, the coaches are following through. So that through line that I think Craig, Chris was, one of you were talking about through line. That was Paul, who was that? Yeah, oh, P Bob and I were talking. So that it's job embedded. If you do a presentation on DOK, the coaches are having a place to look at your questioning and reflect on that. And it's sort of a building wide. So in our theories of action, which I think are linked on our admin links document, you can kind of read what our thinking is um, and look at those numeracy and literacy. Um, you know, it gets, it gets at the, it's a lot to read, but it's, it kind of operationalizes all of these things that we're talking about. In the about. spirit of that, I just want to thank our administrators for being here, our support section administrators. Um, the data is the data. But what we wanted you to see here tonight was not only the comprehensive overview that we generally give at the district level, but to hear from our building administrators about the ways in which they analyze and disaggregate data to make clear decisions about the actions they're gonna take to continually try to improve student performance. And that was the purpose, and I think you showcased that in such brilliant ways this evening from a variety of angles that truly captures the essence that education is really layered and really complex. Um, but thank you very much. We really appreciate all of your hard work and we're happy to bring up some um, subsequent presentations based on some of the additional conversations we have here this evening. Anybody who has any questions, maybe you could write them down, send them to Jennifer. Sure, office. yeah. I mean, yeah. really Send them over. I'll bring them to okay. the next meeting. I'll yeah. absolutely just email them directly to me. Any questions you might have? Okay, is that okay? acceptable? Everyone, you know, yep. board members? Yeah. Very good. Um, should we end this meeting now? Yeah, I see our second set of presenters are here for the regular meeting, but we're happy to answer any questions, bring back any additional information, um, and have and keep having the conversation. I, I do thank you. Very thank you, everybody. Thank you. Five minutes. Five minutes. Um.
to uh, call the meeting to order at 725-26. Um, we can um, put, oh, we're right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call attendance, please. Tia De Palma. Here. Jen DeLongo. Here. Tom Hennessy. Here. Marianne Johnson. Here. Karen Putney. Here. Erica Santiago. Here. Jack Stacy. Here. Lynn Torello. Here. And Michelle DeLucia. Okay. Michelle couldn't be here tonight. So um, I'm going to move right to correspondence. No. no. Still no, Melissa? Uh, for correspondence, no. I don't have anyone online. Okay. Standing committee reports. I'll start with um, personnel. I, we can look at the hires and rehires. There's things to uh, take note of uh, tonight. Yes, you ready? I'm ready for you. Just two things real quick. Uh, East Ham football team had a big win last week. Yay, go Easties. And this afternoon, the East Haven girls co-op swimming team had a big win over West Haven. So we're doing well. Anyone else? East Haven Academy is bringing back their drama club for the younger grades. So they'll be doing their first production in a little while. Nice. Excellent. I forgot about that. Yeah. It's been a while. OK, superintendent. Yes, tonight I'd like to welcome our Sodexo Food Service personnel. Um, they are here to give a little presentation and update relative to our food service program for the 2023-24 school year. Welcome and thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, we always bring warm cookies when you invite us, so feel free to invite us as often as you'd like. Um, so we, uh, we, Alan and I, this is a very informal presentation, but what we would like to do is basically talk about what we've done for the past five years and our plan going forward for the next five years. So this is a little bit of um, some slideshow of things that we've done. We've done farmer's markets. We've done Thanksgiving feasts. We've done, let's not even talk about COVID because you all know what we did, but we, there was a lot of meals that were handed out to families during the COVID time. <clears throat> and we're so thankful to be back face to face with the kids in all of our programs. So we had a lot of program changes and it's important to note that our, we get our guidance from the USDA and the USDA sets these rules for national school breakfast, national school lunch, and summer food service. So our, our um, rules changed vigorously and quickly over the past few years, but they are starting to transition back. And now with our summer food service program that we just ended, um, the biggest, most notable change, and, and I will tell you I'm not a fan of this change, is that we can no longer pass those meals out to be taken and eaten at home. Those meals now have to be consumed on site. And that was a long-standing rule of um, the Summer Food Service Program, but they made some alterations during COVID, um, and they've gone back to that. So that is one of the things that you know I am championing, championing, and when I'm on my committees, the Wellness Committee, that I think that collectively we all have a voice. So maybe collectively, if we speak up, we can start to make some changes in that, because our families don't want to, um, and some of them cannot get out of work, bring their kids to have um, breakfast in the summer or lunch in the summer. So I, I would like to see that one rule changed back to being able to pass those meals out. I think it's beneficial for the families here in East Haven. But having said that, um, some of the other things that we've done, um, you, you see the, the food truck, and we'll talk more about that food truck. Um, and. Um, just big events that we've done in schools. I get calls all the time from principals. Can you come to the school? Can you do this event? I am happy to do that. I'm happy to do cooking contests. We're happy to um, participate um, and, and you know really kind of pull the kids and talk to the kids. So again, 
pre-COVID, we had um, committees, um, youth advisory committees, or, or um, student advisory committees at the high school and the middle school, and then we, we, we got that shut down and we weren't able to do that anymore when COVID came. But that is something we'll talk about a little bit more. We're gonna bring all those back, because I think it's important we feed children. We feed children, you know, breakfast. We feed children lunch. We want to know that what we are offering them is what they want to eat. Um, and as we get through the slides, we'll talk about how our menus have changed, and we are trying to um, just give them more of what they really want. And just to give you a little context for the slide you're seeing, we had a presentation with RJ and Erica and the rest of the Food Service Selection Committee. I know many of the board members here didn't see that, so a lot of these slides you see tonight are kind of a take off of that, so you can kind of make sure that everybody uh, is looking to what we presented back in the spring. Let's go to the next one. So there's just some highlights of what we've done. Um, our participation for lunch has been up 70%. That's huge. And, and you know we've returned over $2 million to the cafeteria, Board of Ed Cafeteria Fund. Um, Profits were reinvested in new equipment, and oh my goodness, were they ever reinvested in new equipment. I have never, I've been in this business for 30 years, and the investment that has been made in East Haven Public Schools kitchens is like, like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, we have been able to purchase new ovens for all of our schools, new stovetops for our schools. We replaced walk-in coolers and walk-in freezers. We actually added new walk-in coolers, and walk we added a new walk-in freezer at JMMS and a new walk-in freezer at for our school, um, new reaching coolers at every school, new steam table lines. Some of those steam table lines were old. They were 30 plus years old at the elementary schools, and this past spring and summer, they were all replaced. A lot of the flooring was replaced as well. Um, so when you walk into the kitchens, it's really such a nice feel because everything is new. It, it's, not, it's not broken. It doesn't look broken down. It looks new and shiny, um, and it's, it's a pleasure to go into those kitchens, and we really want to make it inviting for the kids. So I think that they see new things is exciting to them, too. They were very excited for the steam tables. I didn't think they would notice, but they totally did when they came through, like, oh, wow, this is new. Um, so it's, it's fun to do new, new things. Um, also, the menu boards, that's another new thing. Um, well, it's not new, we did it a few years ago. Um, but it, it, it is some of the money that um, was returned to the district is um, the investment was the menu boards. So all of the elementary schools, with the exception of Overbrook, have menu boards in there, either when you come into the school or into the kitchen where the kids come. And what it is, is displayed on those boards is today's menu, of course. Um, but we were approached by, um, Julie and RJ, if we could um, kind of share those boards. So now we are working to do some community, some school advertisement. So, so it won't just be food service that their message will be up on the board. They'll be rotating slides. So we're a work in progress on that. Um, and I believe Julie has a meeting tomorrow with the principals to discuss that further. But that's another thing that we're going to be we're not going to be doing. And then one of our biggest. Um, uh, one of my biggest prides is the food truck, because that was an expensive investment. We recognize that, and not many districts up until today, I could say East Haven was the only Connecticut district, but I believe another district was able to purchase a food truck today, but we'll be the first one who has it up and running, so that's a point of yeah. pride for us. Yeah, you know, the good news about this investment, hundreds of thousands of dollars of capital investments were put back in the kitchen, and you know, one of the, uh, that we have that we don't want the general fund to have to subsidize the food service program, whether it's just the day-to-day -day operations or in big capital investments. So all that money that we were able to, uh, in partnership with this district, return to the cafeteria fund and allow these purchases now it frees up the general fund to do what it's supposed to do, which is educate the students and then drive student achievement. So we're really proud about that, uh, that achievement. And please feel free to jump in with questions yep. as we go along. So Sodexo's plan is always to grow a healthier future, and we want to work together. That's what we, we consider ourselves partners here in East Haven, I mean, we take that very seriously. Um, so one of the things that we want to do, and it, it is a big focus for, um, for the USDA, it is a big focus for the state of Connecticut, and it's a big focus for us, not only in student um, success, 
but it's really bringing more farm, more farm to school food. They, we, the USDA is really um, encouraging us to buy local, to partner with farmers. So in that we have, um, I have applied for and we've received a few grants. We receive fresh fruit and vegetable grants every year, but we actually got an additional grant this year to work with a farmer to bring actually locally grown, as local as we can get it, food here to East Haven. So we're very proud that we are working for our kids um, to keep them, you know, as engaged as we can. You know, we're going to invite the farmers in for our farmers market. We want to have a real inclusive, you know, environment where the kids see that, you know, corn does not come from a frozen bag in the grocery store. Corn is grown in a field right, probably right down the street from where they live, right? But we also have some fun, fun activities. Um, and I was um, speaking to Anthony Verderam, and I think what we're going to do at one of our elementary schools is actually a corn shucking contest. So we're going to include that in gym class. So we're going to bring in a, a big case of unshucked corn and have you know the kids use it as a gym class. Two lines. Let's have a contest. One bucket at one end of shucked corn. One bucket at the other of unshucked corn. Go down, shuck your corn, come back, put your clean corn in the bin, and when the contest is all over, we're going to take the corn in the kitchen, cook it, and serve it for school lunch. So I think that is, is really trying to be a part of where everybody is going these days, right? More farm to school, more, you know, let's teach kids where the food is coming from, let's make it as fresh as we possibly can, and make it a fun experience for them. So that's what we're, we're focused on. So increasing participation is, is always in our minds. Um, we said we increased uh, lunch participation and we did. Breakfast is, is a work in progress. Breakfast is um, tricky in, in our schools because not all of the kids get to come through the lunch line or the, you know, the line to get breakfast. We actually feed some of them in the hallway. All of our students here at East Haven High School get breakfast right outside in that corridor. Um, and it's difficult when everybody arrives at the building at the same time, right? It's a challenge, um, but we, we make it work. We've got a kiosk. We're going to put a separate kiosk up there and try to separate the lines a little bit. What we really want to do is get the kids to get the food. We know they need the food. We know they want the food. But sometimes, let's face it, it's just not cool to get school breakfast, right? And, and I think they're getting over that for lunch but sometimes they, they don't want to go up if their friends don't go up. So we're doing all that we can to encourage everybody to come up. And we'll say, if you don't want it now, take it for later. Because most of these things can be put in your backpack and eaten later. And we just want to make sure that they have the nutrition when they need the nutrition. Um, we've te we're teaming with culinary. We have such a robust culinary department here. So we work with culinary. Um, we actually have some students. We have um, some of Mr. Swan's students that come to our cafeteria and work every Friday. We have a student who's doing his community, um, his community service hours in our cafeteria, and we're very proud of that. The kids come to us and say, hey, can we come in the kitchen? Can we help? Can we work? And of course, our answer, we always want to say yes. You know, we get the, go through the right channels and get the right permission. Um, but we want to make sure we have, we make everybody feel important. We have something that everybody feels that they've contributed to. Um, so we're also speeding up service with more grab and go items and more fast take items. That's something that we heard, We've, we um, surveyed the students. What's important to you? What do you want? And what they want to do is they want to move through the line faster. They want more time. So we have um, developed a lot of what we call fast takes and grab and goes. So in, in, um, as part of that, as part of our local health department and the USDA is now requiring labels be on everything. And the labels have to include the allergen information as well. And we're hearing a lot of positive feedback from the students about that too. They like that. Oh, I really like that I know what's, what's in this salad. I like that it, that I know it has whey and it has milk. So it's, um, we're, we're getting some real positive feedback from the kids on, um, on just trying to reach out to them more. Yeah, and just a couple things. One, one of the things we committed in the presentation was uh, to expand our digital footprint. And one of those ways was through an app that you can get either through the app store or through the, I don't use an Android phone, but I don't know what the, the Android, the Android app store uh, that you can download. It's called So Happy. 
Uh, we're number two in queue now to get that live in uh, any statement you would think that we flip a switch. And everybody across the company will be able to do it, but it doesn't work that way. So anyway, we're just about there. So you'll be able to see the menu, you'll be able to see the nutritional information within the menus for the parents, for the students, for the nurses. Uh, and really, it's our way to help try and connect to the way, but honestly, the world works, particularly children. But this is, this is it. We can communicate to them through this. I think we can help to drive the participation. The other program, uh, my D text, is an opt-in program where uh, you can communicate with us live time uh, through text. We can we can send out information about daily specials. Kids can, parents can. They can talk about. They can send uh, text in about this is what we like today. This is what we didn't like today. So instead of having to wait for a survey to happen, it can happen in real time. So that's something. Hopefully, Novemberish will be able to roll out here. Uh, but really, we want to uh, to expand that digital uh, footprint so that we communicate in a way that the students understand and uh, and hopefully drive participation and excitement and uh, and get our nurses on board and, and get it, and get the parents on board to what's happening in our menus. To make sure allergens are are, are addressed and that uh, you know, we have full full transparency in the, in the nutritional value of what we're serving. So this is a little bit of what our menus look like. Um, we have different core programs. Our elementary program is the clubhouse program. Our um, high school program is Taste 4. And we have brand new that we rolled out this summer was the foodie at the elementary school. So the foodie menu, um, all the new signage was new. The menu was new. Um, we're basically giving the kids the, the things that we know they like. We're just presenting them in a different way. As everybody knows, you go to your favorite restaurant and you go there because you want your favorite thing. Whether I really love their pizza or I really love their burger, and the kids are no different. They want what they want. So they still want their burgers and they still want their pizza, but we want to be able to give them new things. We want to be able to kind of open up their worlds a little bit and give them new options. So we have really tried to do that. Can you just go into the next slide, please? Um, we've really tried to do that by um, using the pictures of programs, but I wanted to talk about um, some of the things that the kids are really liking. So the clubhouse is the elementary. So again, we're giving them the same things, but we, we gave them a few new options. Um, and one is called a deli stackable box. So basically it's a sandwich, but they can put it together themselves. They love it. It, it is amazing to me how much they love it. And they really like the pizza box. Again, think about those, those um, you know, little things that we buy in the supermarket that are all separated. It's kind of the same concept for pizza. I did not think they would like it. I did it because it was a new item, and of course we're going to roll it out. Then my staff started calling me and saying, stop it. We got 60 today. That's a lot of that B item, which is normally you get 20 or 30 of them. So it's starting to wane a little bit. The excitement is wearing off. But that's our intent to roll out new things so they can always try something new. We don't want them always eating, you know, the burger and the chicken patty, although that you know, it's all good, you know, everything has its place, but we want them to eat more, we want them to have a, a more varied appetite, if you will. We've rolled out a lot of vegan options. We have a vegan, not only a vegetarian burger, it's a vegan burger. I didn't they, they like it, they really do like it. And, and the hummus, we just cannot keep enough hummus because the kids just love those hummus boxes. So so it's almost think of like a bento box, you know, when, when you just maybe are serve the same thing but you offer it a different way. That's what we're finding that the kids really like. They get excited about new things and who doesn't? So we like to, to roll new things out to them. Um, and that's at the clubhouse. Um, what we did with the, um, the Taste 4 is, Again, we're trying to expand those palettes and give them more things. So we did some dips, and it's called um, cheesy breadsticks. And one of them is um, this spicy sauce, sausage dip and another Alfredo dip. Well, the staff had to come in in between waves and make more, and they really had planned on three waves worth of food. But they just the kids just ate us out in wave one and a half. So that tells me we're on the right track. We're going the right way. If we're giving them things that they really get excited about, and when I, and I don't like to see long lines, but I kind of get excited to see long lines because I'll say, what was on that line that day? Because we want to we want to menu that again because the kids really liked it, and it's about giving the kids what they like. So with our taste for menu, 
I'm sorry, not taste for, with our foodie menu, we're coming off of something called DYK. It was called Did You Know? And again, every day they had cert at their options. They could get a cheeseburger over here. They could get pizza over here. And we're still we're giving them pizza a couple days a week and cheeseburgers a couple days a week. But we're giving them more other options that they really, you know, we're trying to see if they like them. And so far they have. A big surprise to me is roasted butternut squash. I did not think the kids would like it as much as they did, but for two weeks in a row, we have run out of roasted butternut squash. We're actually on two cases each time we're serving it. So that's pretty impressive that the kids are really liking the roasted butternut squash as much as they are. And the par pork carnitas. Again, not what you think of with traditional school lunch, right? But they really love the pork carnitas um, and pulled pork nachos. So those are some of the favorites that they've liked um, at, with this new, foodie menu at the middle school, but they're liking the concept. Um, I think so far with our new pro with these programs, the feedback from the kids have been positive. But we're gonna get back to those committees and get back to, to the regular conversations so we can try to continuously improve and give them more of what they want. And I think uh, you see some pictures up here, they're not pictures you know, that, are, that were made in the back and they're actually some of the menu items that will be served. Uh, I granted we're not going to have the computer bowls, but we get an idea of the, the types of scratch cooking that we're trying to bring to the student body, and we're also trying to make sure that our diversity of menu items mirrors the community that we're in, uh, because as we all know our community is diversified, <coughs> and so uh, we're trying to make sure that our menu is not only has the best uh, ingredients, boar's head, boar muscle meat, chicken, things of that nature, uh, but they reflect the, the, the taste palettes that are out in the community today. And we do it from a scratch, not from a can or a jar, uh, to really provide the, the greatest fresh effect. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the new rendering, by the way, for the food truck. I don't know if you can see it from there. It's fresh off the presses, right, this week? It's close. It's close. Pretty close. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I had to. I came back from Albany today. I had to run and get my computer and come back here, so I didn't have a chance to update RJ's latest rendition. But uh, but you get the sense of, of what it's going to look like. And I think this week, right, it's going to get wrapped. We'll put, we took a, and it's local. It's a local event. Yes. Yeah, so that we, um, and working with RJ, we really wanted to, to find a good local vendor uh, and not take it somewhere else and escape the source of work. And so I know RJ did a lot of work. To find that and to source that, and so we're finally going to be able to grant fruition. The health department has finally blessed it for the most part, although we have to have it brought us the wrong application, we need an application. But anyway, I think by uh, probably the end of the week or next week, we're going to have it out on the road and, and doing this thing for the month of October until it gets too cold. But, uh, but anyway, you can talk about it. Yeah. So we're very hopeful about that. And, and you know that we brought the food truck back here last year, but things do not go as fast as we would like them to go. Um, and, and we've worked through all that, and we are now at the very tail end. So now we can actually get out on the road and do what we had intended it to do, which is basically get to the schools. I want the food truck to visit all the schools. I know I spoke to this before, but that is the intent of it, to get it out to the schools so the kids can see it, so they feel like you know a little bit of ownership in it. And we, we're going to do some fun events around the food truck as well. So we'll do some outdoor fairs, weather permitting, and you know, I'll work with principals to make sure it all works their schedule. But that is our plan, to make it a part of kind of the, I don't want the kids to be surprised by it. I want them to be like excited that it's come, like, oh, wow, the food truck's here, the food truck's here. That's the kind of, you know, that's the response that we want to get to. We want it it to be a staple in their everyday. So the intent is to get that food truck to all the schools for fun events for them, and then of course to get it to some of the other events like high school football games. Wouldn't it be nice to have a food truck at the high school football game? And some of the other events they do, maybe perhaps post-prom. There's a lot, of possibilities are endless. Um, and actually when we were going through the, um, the licensing part, we actually had the fire marshal ask us about it. So it, it's an exciting, Piece and it's a it's a beautiful truck. I, I hope you can all will invite you all to tour the food truck when it makes its debut appearance at one of the schools. Um, but Lance and his crew have you know shined it and buffed it and it is beautiful on the inside. It has got beautiful equipment, state of the art. We're really excited to get it around and start doing you know what we intended it to do. 
But without the food truck, we're still doing our, our other fun events, which are um, we're celebrating National School Lunch Week, the week in October, um, National School Breakfast Week, all those things that you know school lunch is known for. Um, we want to make sure that we celebrate all these things of, of National lunch, School Lunch Program because that's important. Um, produce fairs, as I mentioned about the farmers, we're going to have produce fairs at some of our schools. We're still finalizing with our produce company, but we'll bring in a farmer and set up a beautiful display. You saw a photo in the first slide that we did years ago, but we need to bring that back and we need to bring it back at our school so the kids really can touch the produce, try things they haven't tried before. It's all about that experience for our kids. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so, so that's... So get ready for this menu, <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe at the next board meeting in October, we can dine al fresco at the food truck, if things are ready to go, and uh, kick it off that way and introduce you to uh, real world. But uh, we look forward to that, and uh, and honestly, um, you know, we're really we're grateful that we're here again for the next five years. Uh, it's a tremendous responsibility that we don't take lightly to nourish the students, the future leaders of this of this, uh, of this community and of this country that we live in. And uh, you know, we will do everything on our part to help uh, drive good nutrition, so we can uh, do our part to drive student uh, student achievement. Uh, we look really forward to it. So thank you for the opportunity to be here again. Thank you. And um, be happy to take any questions. Like that. I just wanted to know, if, did you guys introduce yourselves? I missed it. If you didn't, forgive me. You know what? We, uh, we, we did not. I think, uh, yeah. So my name is, um, I think you all know Linda. Uh, but I'm Alan Dean. I, I'm the district manager here in Connecticut. I support Linda. And I'm Linda Stanisi and food service director here. So my office is housed here. but. I probably have run into many of you at schools or at the cashier line when we're short stuffed. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, that's my point. I go to all of our schools because I am the food service director for this town. Thank you. She's a good one, I will tell you. And I know I'm a little bit biased, but uh, I know that I'm very fortunate. And I think everyone here is fortunate to have one day here in the community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Look forward to that food truck. <laughs> It's exciting. You guys have come a long way. We have come a long way. We sure have. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much for your Thank partnership. You. We really appreciate it. Thank you for allowing us to be. Of course. Okay. Shall we move on? Yes. Assistant Superintendent, do we back up to that? Yeah, I just, I will um, reiterate to the public that we, prior to today's meeting, we had a um, hour and a half workshop to o provide an overview of the Smarter Balanced Assessments. Uh, that information is recorded and I believe accessible online for those of you um, that want to take a deeper dive and there will be an executive summary highlighting the major points um, that we are working on to uh, share with next week's minutes in my assistant superintendent's report. Um, so rather than go again oh, and restate everything that we said in an earlier meeting, um, I'll just provide an opportunity. Anybody else have any additional questions, please email them to me. Thank you. Yep. CEO Meppo, <laughs> so we have one agenda item that we'll discuss when we get there. In addition to that, there is our health insurance uh, report for the first two months. Um, as in years past, the first two months are coming out hot and heavy. Uh, expenses have been pretty high. Uh, we've seen our health um, patterns going back to pre-COVID times where people are getting more, more procedures and going back to the doctors more. So you'll see in our first two months there is a high expense. Um, that normally happens in our years, but we are, um, as the months progress, we'll see them hit their cap and then that should fade off. Um, so we have, we have drawn our money to, to fund that cash flow and we are just waiting for it to wait, um, slow down as it does in normal years. Thank you. Okay, so we have questions? Sure. Yeah. Above. Yeah. Um, I, I, RJ, can you just explain um, 
It's the first page. It doesn't have a number. It says PO is over 7,000. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, the second item uh, and the fourth item. So children's community program, $315,000 tuition for four students. And then the next one, which, which averages 78,750 a student. Yep. The next one is uh, 568000 for five students, or 113600 We're spending almost a million dollars, $883,000. These programs, are they state mandated or, you know? Just you can just Bob can speak to, to they're, they're all special education private special schools. Education. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not objecting to these kids getting everything that yep. they need, but I'm, you know, when I see $883,000 for nine students, um, it, it's just something I felt I had to question. So Jack, wherever possible, we try to maintain students in district. There are situations in which um, the district's unable to provide the services a child may need to the level they need it, which results in a private, approved private special education outplacement. Those tuitions are expensive, and as we move forward, working with the superintendent, assistant superintendent, and CFO, we're trying to extend and develop some robust services in district so we can continue to bring those kids back. Um, as we bring kids back though, that's, there's also expenses on the front end that we have to be, that we have to recognize, right? Those kids have to come back to sometimes very specific uh, supports and accommodations, which may include a high level of nursing care or individualized instruction or maybe one-to-one -one behavioral management. So there's a lot of uh, give and take and tension between when we decide to keep a kid in the district and when we have to move a kid to an out-of-district placement. Under most circumstances, we want to uh, maintain students in the least restrictive environment as required by state and federal law, and that's what we attempt to do. So this is more than just tuition, right? I read tuition means that, that we're just paying that to get them in, and then there's additional costs. This is a total cost. That's the total cost. medical total, care or whatever else well, is needed. It's usually 99% of the time, it's those, all those services are not, these are food reference, are not a la carte. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's tuition and the related, it's, so it's educational expenses and the related services that those students would require. Now, related services includes nursing, speech, PT, OT, behavioral. Um, just to be completely transparent, though, it does not include transportation costs associated with those kids. All right, so may maybe we can list that as tuition and related services other than just saying tuition. Sure. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Questions for the places? Okay, so I, um, approval of minutes, I guess we don't have to ask if there's any, any questions or objections to the minutes? Okay, um, we'll move on to our uh, audience of citizens. If there's anyone who would like to speak, anyone here? Sure. <laughs> No? Okay. All right, we shall move on. And then that brings us to new business, 6.1, discussion and first reading of policy 3542.41, professional standards for food service personnel. And yes. I think this is a required policy um, that the board currently does not have. We received a sample from CAVE, and so, um, it's been adjusted for our district given the food services is outsourced to a vendor. So tonight's just a first reading. Uh, obviously, we'll have to bring it back for a second reading and approval. Okay. 
I have a question on it or comment? Please. Paragraph three, the first sentence. Board shall engage with a food service vendor that complies with the minimum professional standards. That sounds like we're going with the, like the, could we get rid of the word minimum just with the professional standards for school nutrition? Sure. Maybe essential or, you know, yeah. required? Yeah, something. But minimum just, just thrown out ideas. With the required? Yeah. How about required? Thank you. I just, uh, yeah, that's, that's it does a make good sense. suggestion. Because you have to, you know, follow the state yep. mandates. Right. Um, that's all I, I think um, so. So there's no vote on to take on this. Yes. This is just a first read. Yep. Um, on that note, I would just like to add. Um, I, maybe I should have asked the food um, the personnel that presented, but like I saw something on Facebook advertising for right. food service. I mean, I did too. It's like on Facebook, you know. On our district Facebook page? Yeah, no, it's There's just out there. Right. I don't think I got. I w I was I'm sorry, I'm unclear what you're Somebody saying. put out, we need personnel for food service, please apply, blah, blah. You know, I don't know. It just seemed a little odd to see it there. It was just on Facebook. I saw but it. But it did too. direct them to a website it to did? fill out an application. I didn't see that. Yeah. Yes. I did not yeah. see that. The comment yeah. did direct them to. Go so this was a fa like just a public Facebook posting. Yes, yes. it was just a, oh. a Facebook post that just said in general. Yeah, like, I've seen you're looking to work in food service. Yeah, I've August seen those website. for paraprofessionals for other Correct. districts. I've seen them for bus drivers. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to be clear. Yeah. That's all. That that's okay. Yeah, that's I think fine. it's just somebody sharing. In Correct. Yeah, like, okay. you know, good jobs yeah. available if you're looking. Like I agree. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't have a problem. I just wanted to ask about it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so 6.2, discussion and possible action on the approval of the electric charging station. Is this new? Yes, so this is a town initiative which they have asked me to bring to your attention this evening for a vote. Um, the town is contracting with a vendor to add an electric charging station at every town building. They would like to extend that to our schools. Um, but before doing so, they would like the board to vote on, even though they are town buildings during school hours, they are our buildings, so they want the permission of the board to do so. Um, I personally went to the, all the buildings with the, with the vendor to script out the place of where the charging station would, would be. Um, so that is all set, but they are holding on moving forward and signing until the board approves tonight. So, cost is there a cost to us? That's a there, good there's no cost to us. It is an incentive program that um, I believe the UI is running with this vendor, so there is no cost to the town for installation, and it comes with a free five-year maintenance plan. Um, so there, initially, there is there's no cost to us until year six. At year six, it is three hundred dollars um, per station per year, and there is an upcharge for um, anyone beyond the school employee that would pay for this that over those five years would pay for those maintenance fees. So is this only for school employees? Um, no, so it, it can be for anyone in, in the community, but the way it will be set up is all employees will have a code um, where, they, where they won't have to pay for the charging. So it would bring up members of the community onto the school property Correct. during school hours? Um, it would, for the community, it would be after school hours. Okay, but what about we just banned. Correct. During school hours, nobody banned. During school hours, it's for teachers if they want to. After school hours, if somebody wants to come up and charge, they, they're eligible to do something. How will that be managed, though, RJ? How do you make sure that there's not community members coming on school grounds during school hours if there's no teacher charging? Um, so there, there's no specific spaces for these. They're, they're going to be placed in grass. And my, my assumption personally is since our parking lots are so full that our staff will be util utilizing that space, whether they're charging or, or, or not. Is, that's a concern. Yeah, I, I think so. A concern. I, that concerns me. Also, we have um, the security guard halfway right down here. the hill during the, the school hours, at which point he's stopping all of the cars and the town's putting the, the guard station well, down that's here. here. But not here. here on entries. Correct. Oh, it's here in a, I see. It's I, here I'm sorry. So you're going to have after to school hours, kids yeah. could be playing, you know, who or whatever around there, right? Mm -hmm. So cars could, depending on where their the station is, mm -hmm. cars can come up. I mean, and and 
and I don't know. Being so public property, if it's right, if school it's is closed, hours. anyone can go and park. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right, yeah. at any time, even without charging. They can just go and park in the parking lot. They can use the track so, as it is. At, yeah, Correct. after hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm just thinking. That That's a red flag, though. I mean, when I was working, and I would see a car parked in our school parking lot, I would do something about that. I, I don't know. I. Are they going to be listed, or are they can be searchable online? Ours, ours will not be no. So that's. I is there is well. there a way to adjust the settings so that it doesn't function during the regular school day unless you have a code and you're a staff member? So even if you are a community member, during regular school hours, it's programmed as such where you can't access a charge right. only if you have a code. For members of the school community, including parents, because they're part of your community. I, I don't know. I just in this day and age, when we worry about safety, that's the safety concern. Mm -hmm. And and our school grounds are, you know, even at the closing and you know, closing of school, there's lots of traffic coming, going. Somebody wants to get in and charge or something, and it's, I don't know. I I personally would like to hold this table and talk about. I don't know. I'm, I don't know so if anyone I think I'd feel better knowing it's not searchable because I know like a lot of people will search for their closest charging station. Correct. If we're not a searchable station, I would think the only people that would want to be using it would be people that were going to be at the school for something else anyway, or they're already parked there. That, right. But that's making sense. assumptions. I don't, I don't know. think it's any different than someone coming up at the right. school property not during the school day and parking in a parking right. spot. I, they don't do that. But right. then we pay for this. And it's it's not I don't know. Uh, how does it work? Does the the electric bill go up? Like I don't know how that yeah, works. I would ask that too. So the first five years the company who installs it covers the fee of um, the incentive that we get for it covers the charge for it for the, that first five five years. Well like when someone has it plugged in, what does that energy come from? The energy comes from our electricity, but the the benefit the town is being able to see from the incentive will offset that. And the upcharge that so like uh, let's use simple math. Say it, it's it's a dollar. We charge ten cents more per charge. Mm -hmm. Like they said, for a full charge, it costs somebody eight eight dollars. That over the five years, if you get enough of those eight dollars, it'll cover your fee for the next for the next years yeah. in that five year period. Like after the five years, right? Yeah. Be more inclined to say yes at like the high school. I feel like in this end of town, maybe you know the other elementary schools are close enough that if it was a town person, they would come to the high school. Um, maybe putting multiple at the high school um, where we do have the guard station, and you know like the middle school, the hockey rinks right there. We can't, you know, like the town could put it at the hockey rink like really if they mm -hmm. wanted to. And, there is know, one going to the hockey rink. And, you know, like, Mamawan School, the beach is there. They could put it at the Mamawan beach. Mamawan School is also very, very limited on parking. Yeah. 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 I, I also think that Tunnel School, Tunnel School is, a, you know, just limited on parking. I, I really I really think that. Can we start with maybe, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, so I, I believe the incentive is one station per address. So we can't put multiple at, at a school, but we we can... The board can make a motion. Yeah, it's your, it's your decision. you believe to be appropriate. Right. I feel like it would be used more wherever parents and families are coming off hours, which would be the high school for games and activities. Mm -hmm. So I have one other concern. Like, what's to stop, you know, the same teacher from parking at this thing every day and causing, you know what I mean? Like, just thinking ahead, I, I hope. Hopefully that's not a problem, but it, it could potentially like, you know, somebody gets here early every day and takes it and other people feel, you know, What do you mean? Do they park there? I don't understand. Like use the charging port. Like they, how long does it take to charge a car? It, <laughs> it depends on the car and yeah, how, how low your battery is. It, it, they said it can vary from a couple hours to a full day. Based it's on what your strategy is, right. yeah, it's not a, it's That's not like a Tesla supercharger. No. But the app that you use, they do say like when your car is full, you do get a text message back 
saying that your car is full. So if it, if it did become a problem, we could encourage people to, when they get that text, maybe go Obviously. move. If you have time to go out, leave your, your classroom and go get your car. You know? Yeah. I don't know. It just sounds weird that you want to put them in schools with the kids. I think no, because there's not many teachers even have electric. Um, there's two staff members that I know of. How many? I think here we have three or four. Now, what about what about students? Are they going to be able to during the school day? We're going to have students who are going to be driving here with electric cars. Correct. Right. So to be available to them as well during the school Tommy's day. Tommy's cars are like they can't during the school day. We'd be parking there for me. Why not? They're students. They're here. They're parking their car. Correct. No, can students? So you're going to allow students to come here during the day and charge their cars? If yeah, they're here. They drive to school. Yeah. school. They're here. You're going to have one charging station. What if, like? That's what we're saying. Yeah, that's why I'm worried about it. Well, I can assure problem. you that people with electric cars already have this planned out. Like they're not going to be like, oh, let me go to East Haven High School because I have to charge my car. I guarantee you, they charge their cars because it's like filling up your gas tank. Right. You need to have your gas. They need to have electricity. I'm sure they plan it ahead. It's more or less a convenience, I think. To the I just don't know if it belongs in the school. Building. In my opinion, I don't think it belongs at schools, but that's me. I agree. I really don't think it belongs at the school, so I would prefer not to vote on this and get more information, but that's me, again. So I'll make a motion to table this to, um, to get more information. I'll Come second. back and, and second. Uh, review it. Okay. Who would you like? The information from so I can get whoever them. is putting and what information maybe well, forward RJ your questions like your specific questions so that they can bring your specific questions to them like what question you know, I would like to know why why school I mean we're trying to keep these schools safe from drivers kid people coming going you know we already we now have implemented that no one can come up use the track during the day you know I don't know I just I don't know the plan. Like, how do you know who's out there? If there's a teacher out there using it every day. I feel like it's the same as if anyone comes to the school to park at the school with the question if they're parked in a regular spot versus a charging station spot. If there's, you know, where like they would be with their car if they're not here for any purpose. But, but they can't do it during the day, though, right? Yeah. During stuff. Just regular, like unless they have business at the building, they can't use it during the day. I just don't think it's necessary. I, I think I agree with that, yeah. I just, I don't think it's necessary to put them at schools. Like, what's our benefit? Like, yeah. And ultimately, it will cost us money. I mean, not right now, like five years, that's great, but. And who knows what that would be? I don't know. We might five be, years, it's gonna be a lot more electric vehicles. Yes, there are, well, and then hopefully, then we'll get 10 of them in the parking lot or whatever we need. Well, we have, we have there a are other that places in town where they second. can go. Doesn't have to be at schools. Yeah, yeah. including their house. They use their own electricity. <laughs> I don't. I, I would. I would. So we do we do we, we have, have to vote? We have a motion and it was second. So. If you table it, you need two thirds vote, right? Correct. Somebody. Yeah. Yes. So we should go, maybe do a roll call vote if to they would to table, table this. Just one second. I'm changing the. Do you think, I mean, RJ, you understand our concerns? I mean, yeah, listen, I it's not, it's not my, uh, it's not my <laughs> project. I'm just, brought this. I mean, I'm that's, just I'm just concerned. concerned. I'm the it messenger, I will make sure. It came from, just came, a clarification, it came from. It came from the town, it came from, yeah. The town. But the town is doing this initiative for their buildings and they wanted to include us so as well. The town should come Maybe that's, 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 somebody come in yeah, and explain yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. And why a school? I know they're thinking of helping the people who work at those schools, it sounds like, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I honestly would be all for it at the high school. I feel like the high school is really kind of a community center. We come, we have sporting events here. We use our auditorium for things. People rent the space, the gym. Like I, I have, and, and we have adult students here, and they're not going to be able to charge during the day unless they're already allowed here. So I have no problem with the high school, but I also think we really would need multiple. Like, I, I don't, all right now, you know. And who's going to man it if, if somebody put, wants to use it and then somebody else, like the same person, like you said, who's going to stop that person from well, it's table. Do we have a thing to roll Yeah, go ahead. You ready? Sorry. Tia De Palma. Yes. Table. Jen DeLongo. Yes. 
Marianne Johnson? Yes. Karen Putney? Sure. Erica Santiago? Yes. Jack Stacy? Yes. Lynn Torello? Yes. And Michelle, Del oh. Michelle Delucia is absent. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so that's table. So we can, um, any future agenda items, just keep in mind that the next meeting is October 10th, 2023. So I have a future agenda. Do you want to just email it or say it? Um, you could say it and, and maybe email Michelle. So I feel like we need a workshop or an agenda item or something about this extended day. Yeah. Because we never talk about it and it's come it's gonna come fast and we don't have once the grant ends it it the last yeah. Mm -hmm. unless the funding Good idea. I think that's excellent too. So let's all maybe Erica will hear that and put that um Yeah. Something. So the agenda item is just discussion and it possible might have action like a workshop. A workshop? Yeah, yeah, then we can just solve that. I think it would be helpful. So we can see we financial can impact and it's gonna be some decisions to so stay here until in advance. Well, I think a huge variable based on the, the discussion will be if the board is planning on including the funding to do so in their budget request. And what will it cost? Right. And what will it cost? So yes. the impact maybe, of that. like you said, a workshop to hear the input and feedback from the board that will then drive certain actions and or subsequent. Um, and you guys might have to do a presentation yeah. as to how it's impacted the students. We can, have staff. we can have our principals back with the wing block. That is how we are using the additional the 30 minutes. We'll break down Good. what the cost will be. And the so I would that love teacher easy. input as to, like, if, if that's doing, does that sound? And I think like, it looks different at each school. Yes, it does. And I think the sizes of the schools matters. The bigger schools, I think, have, harder to, have a harder time. Well, and your and your secondary more, schools making it much more <coughs> difficult because you do have a greater amount of students too. So it definitely is worth a workshop to get it going to formulate right. our questions. Maybe start preparing questions and send them to me, Erica. Okay. I, I have a, just a note for research sake. Would you be able to leave like? you know, maybe the elementary schools at a longer half hour and the high school, I, you know, is that something you can do? Could you split up the district like that or would it have to be the whole district? I'm just, you know. I'm thinking like because of the MOU with the teacher's contract. It would be hard to do. It would be a couple different times. It would be a couple different. There, there wasn't an MOU because if you recall, the board acted upon a clause in the actual contract that allowed you to compensate oh. teachers if you extended the day. Um, I'm thinking that because the bargaining unit has members pre-K-12 that it would apply to everybody, but I, it's worth maybe part of the discussion when we have yeah. a workshop. Yeah, I just, so yeah, we, I don't. And, solicit ideas from some of the people that are using this and you know we put heads together and see what can come up here busing right? busing played thing. a large role in that factor as well when we tried to tier those times and extend one half than the other they weren't able to make the run of the first tier with an extended time right. Right. with the short with the other time so you have to keep it work for the anything I else that at the last meeting that we should probably consider maybe doing an informal poll of the teachers regarding their thoughts on this as well. It would be good Well, that's what I was wondering. If have that data yeah. that we have discussed just to know what their feelings are. Mm -hmm. Motion to adjourn. Second. We're adjourned. Mm -hmm.